So the next panel, we have four um, people participating. And so it'll be Chad Bender, who you heard from this morning, um, he's from the University of Arizona. Deborah Fisher, who also gave a great talk this morning, who is a professor of astronomy at Yale. Um, Andreas, who just finished speaking, and then um, a new face, Mike Endel, who's a senior research scientist and lecturer at McDonald Observatory at the University of Texas at Austin. So the way um, this is going to work is I'll give the people who already spoke this morning a few minutes to say any other concluding thoughts or things they didn't get to say. Um, and then Andreas and uh, Mike both had pre-recorded uh, talks that were totally um, pre-recorded. And so if they want a little bit more time to summarize those talks or have any slides to present, that would be okay too. So first, Chad, did you have any um, additional quick comments from your um, talk that started us off this morning? I don't, I don't think so, uh, Joanna. I think uh, I'm happy to just let the, the questions lead the discussion and uh, give Mike a little more time to give his summary. Okay. Um, how about Deborah? Anything you wanted to add um, from your talk this morning? Um, I don't think so. I, I loved Andreas's talk and yeah, I, I, one thing I guess I would say is that um, he was talking about using the calibrator um, in, through a SIM fiber, so separate. And we actually use the, put the calibration light through the uh, science fiber. So what we're doing is we're bookending, we're, we're bracketing our stellar observations with uh, calibration light. And that way, I, I like that because we are calibrating the actual pixels where the spectrum is falling. And by interpolating uh, then the wavelength solution to account for a small, the small but smooth drift through the night, we're able to, I think, get uh, the same precision that you get using a SIM fiber. Okay, thanks. Andreas, you just gave an excellent shorter version of one of your pre-recorded talks, but you had a second pre-recorded talk. Did you want to summarize that one or say anything briefly about the talk you just finished? Yes. Um, I don't want to summarize my talk really, but I wanted to show one slide that I think is um, particularly um, relevant um, for, for people who um, just start to get used to this field. Um, with a few numbers that are, I think are really useful that I always um, present to my students that I think they should remember because it helps you to do calculations in your head very easily. Um, so the question here is how difficult is it to de detect extrasolar planets? And of course, this is very different um, for Earth-like planets or Jupiters for um, planets at large orbital separation, small orbital separation. So to keep yourself um, oriented in this, um, it's very useful to remember a few rough numbers and scaling relations. So I start with the radius of planets. And there the numbers to remember is the radius of the sun to Jupiter to the earth is 100 to 10 to one. From that, for instance, you can immediately calculate the depth of transits, which is proportional to the square of this. So a Jupiter um, transiting the sun would have a depth of 100, or an Earth transiting the sun would have a depth of 10 to the minus four. The next numbers to remember are the densities. Sun to Jupiter to Earth is one to one to three. Also easy to remember. From those numbers, you can immediately get the mass ratio because, of course, the mass is proportional to the density and it's also proportional to the cube of the radius. So from that, you immediately get the mass ratio. That is 300,000 to 300 to one. You don't have to remember this because you can get it from radius and density. And now, of course, you know the um, uh, the um, conservation of momentum tells you that the, if the mass is high, the velocity is low and conversely. So another number that you should remember is the orbital velocity of the Earth around the Sun, which is 
30 kilometers per second. And finally, the simple scaling from Kepler's laws, the velocity is proportional to one divided by the square root of the, um, the velocity is proportional to one divided by the square root of the semi-major axis or the distance. So one final number then is the definition, one astronomical unit at one parsec is one arc second. This is really all you have to have in your head and you can do all kinds of calculations within 10 seconds. For instance, if you want to know the Doppler velocity and the astrometric signature of an Earth around a G star at 10 parsecs, the velocity you just take, the velocity of the orbit of the Earth is three kilometers, 30 kilometers per second, and you divide by the mass ratio and 30 kilometers per second divided by 300,000 is 10 centimeters per second. Here you go. If you want to know the astrometric signature, you take the one arc second at one, one, one arc second at one AU is, uh, sorry, one arc second at one parsec corresponds to one AU. So at 10 parsecs, it's um, one, one AU is 0.1 arc second, again, 0.1 arc second, you just divide by the mass ratio by 300,000, you are at 0 0.3 micro arc seconds. So this is, with these numbers, you can always make calculations of how precisely do I have to make my measurements for transits, for radio velocities, for astrometry, you can do that very easily. So I wanted to show these numbers because I think these are really useful numbers to keep in your mind and you don't need many more. Thanks very much. That'll be what I just print and hang up next to my desk. Um, so Mike, do you have um, some slides to share from your pre-recorded talk or want to just give a verbal summary? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I will just give a short verbal uh, summary of my talk, but let me first um, say something. I'm very impressed by Chad's new haircut. I haven't <laughs> seen you in a while and <laughs> it's <looks> really nice. <laughs> um, so what, uh, what did I do in my talk? I gave basically a relatively broad overview over the current ecosystem of present uh, EPRB instruments and I highlighted uh, four instruments in particular which were Espresso, Carmenes and uh, HPF and Nuit. So I'm personally only involved in one of them in, in HPF at the HET which is the first near infrared uh, spectrograph that has a working uh, laser frequency comb for the calibration and I, I just want to, to say that it's absolutely impressive for me how this field has moved on and how this, uh, all these incredible instruments are currently becoming available. Since when I started in this field, um, yeah, a little over 20 years ago, uh, you know, 15 meters a second were kind of the, the state of the art and we were mostly working with instruments which were originally not built to do uh, precise radio velocities. And we are really now currently on a, on a, on a threshold when you just look at this, uh, at this impressive data coming down from, from uh, Espresso, for instance, on, on Proxima B. It's just absolutely breathtaking that you get now to something like 30 centimeters a second. And with new it coming online, hopefully pretty soon at, at Win, we will have an, uh, a community instrument, which will maybe deliver very similar uh, pre extreme precision. So uh, I think that that's basically uh, a summary of what I was talking about. And then again, thank the, the organizers for, for inviting me. Well, thanks for, for joining us. Um, and uh, I know some people have scheduling conflicts, so um, if anyone has to, any of the panelists have to step out, that's totally understandable. Um, I have, there are some questions that have been asked by the attendees, um, and so I'll try to get to some of those in the panel as well. But um, I wanted to start out with 
something that I just noticed wasn't discussed very much, at least by, by most people, but um, might be referenced in some of the talks tomorrow. And so I just want to bring up the idea from the instrumentation side, which is um, was actually a question that one of the attendees asked about the iodine cell technique and how is that, how does that compare to the other techniques that have been talked about? Is it better in some ways or worse in others? Um, uh, and uh, yeah, a lot of the earlier generation PRV instruments were based on this, these absorption cells. Um, and so just maybe a few people who might have worked with those types of instruments might briefly describe um, how they work and the um, pros and cons of using them. Yeah, yeah. that ties into the... Um... The iodine cell was, is basically something I've been using for 20 years. So I'm actually not uh, using much those, those new generation of instruments, but I grew up with the iodine cell. So the iodine cell is a, is a very, very smart idea that um, you can basically just uh, superimpose a reference spectrum, uh, a reference atmosphere in this case, a temperature and pressure stabilized uh, molecular iodine vapor. So that has a very, very dense rotational and vibrational uh, line spectrum. Those are thousands of lines, very sharp, unresolved lines that get, you insert this thing into the light path of a spectrograph. And the wonderful thing about this is that when you pass the starlight through that iodine cell, your spectrograph doesn't need to be stabilized in, in, in any shape and form. It helps, of course, if you have a, a, a relatively stabilized instrument, but the original idea behind the iodine cell was something to have a calibrator that you can use for any kind of high resolution spectrograph. So we use them, we, we, we use them on a regular basis for non-stabilized, multi-mode, multi-user instruments, uh, like the ones typically at McDonald Observatory or at, uh, back in the uh, Lick Observatory. So you insert this into the light path, the starlight goes through, and, and another very, very pro thing for the iodine cell is that you can actually look at these sharp iodine lines, which are unresolved, and you can basically reconstruct the instrumental profile uh, of the unstabilized spectrograph during the time of observation. So for something that when you don't stabilize the spectrograph, like in, in nowadays with, with Harps Espresso and Carmenus and the other instruments, your PSF wobbles around <laughs> uh, all the time. And especially, of course, the asymmetries in the PSF in the instrumental profile are are introducing systematic Doppler shifts into your uh, spectrum that are not coming from the star. So that was the idea of the, of the, of the iodine cell and it was predominantly used uh, for non-stabilized spectrographs. So one of the most productive iodine cell spectrographs is HIRES at Keck, which um, delivered, you know, I don't know how many <laughs> planet papers were published based on, on high reservoirs with the iodine cell, but there are some drawbacks uh, about the iodine cell. First, it absorbs light. So you, you cut down uh, by something of the order of uh, almost a magnitude sometimes, uh, the starlight. And the other a major drawback is it is, um, it is limited in its bandwidth. You basically only have useful lines from 500 to 600 nanometers. So you can only work with, the, with these 100 nanometers to get you to your Doppler precision. It's also very uh, heavy on, on data analysis. So the, the algorithms to reproduce, um, to reduce everything to RV, including the, the, the PSF reconstruction, are kind of comp pretty complicated and, and, and uh, computational um, uh, expensive. Well, not anymore. Not at the beginning they were, but nowadays with fast computers, <laughs> it's no longer that expensive. And so this this um, this limits. I think the iodine cell can provide in in really really good conditions uh, and and a radio velocity long term precision of over one of about a meter a second 
but you can't go below because you're losing basically the Doppler information by having a limited uh, uh, bandwidth. So that therefore, I think it's quite natural that the field has moved building all these super stable kind of espresso type and new type instruments where you have a very wide wavelength range that you can use at a, at a high resolution. So a wonderful idea and wonderful thing to have, to have had this out in cell technique since you turn any high resolution spectrograph in the world into a planet finder by just putting in this little thing and then analyzing the data correctly. So I was also interested in Deborah's perspective on that question as someone who's worked um, on both the kind of iodine um, types of instruments and now with Express, the other flavor of very stabilized spectrograph. So Deborah, yeah. I don't know if you had lessons learned from both yeah, of those experiences. No. Th thanks, Johanna. Um, so first of all, Michael, that was just a beautiful explanation of iodine cell. And I think the reason that I also grew up <laughs> with the iodine cell and used it for through probably 2011, um, as we were transitioning to other instruments. Um, and the reason that I abandoned the iodine cell was um, sort of pressure to, or desire to get to extremely high precision. And as Michael said, the iodine cell is limited to single measurement precision of one meter per second. But what really hurts, I think, is that this forest of iodine lines that are imprinted on the spectrum tend to obscure some of the subtle line profile variations that we can use to, um, as indicators for stellar activity, um, maybe in more surgical ways than the global parameters, calcium H and K, full width half max, things like that. Um, so, uh, so for me, it was um, the desire to build a spectrograph, which is not just detecting like delta lambda over lambda, but which is really trying to disentangle photospheric uh, velocity contributions from the center of mass velocity contributions. Andreas or Chad, did you want to weigh in on this question at all? I've never used iodine, so <laughs> I am not qualified to say anything about it. Um, yeah, so this, um, this is directly linked um, to what I said um, about spectrograph stability. Um, one of the effects that we have to control in other instruments is the difference between the two fibers. And um, the difference of the two fibers, um, first of all, means that um, there is, an, there is a, a contribution by the spectrograph being unstable. But the more important one is the one that I also showed, that is the um, requirement to have um, a constant illumination of the fiber. And that is certainly one of the areas we have um, made good progress in using these octagonal fibers and other schemes to make this very uniform, but um, as we push down to 10 centimeters per second, this re certainly remains a concern that it may not be possible to achieve sufficient uniformity in the input. Um, the basic idea of the iodine cell avoids this problem um, because there you have only one spectrum that carries both the, inf the calibration information and the information about the stellar radio velocity. Now, there are other reasons why one cannot easily push to uh, one meter per second with this iodine technique, for instance, the limited wavelength range. Um, but that makes the method so suitable also for relatively cheap spectrographs, also on small telescopes. One can do that with a one meter telescope, for instance. It is um, the fact that you don't really have to stabilize your spectrograph and worry about these differential effects between two fibers and the effect of fiber illumination. That's the great advantage of that method. Okay, thanks. Um, so a couple more questions that just came to mind for, for me during your talks. Um, which is what new or innovative collaborations were necessary for 
building the current suite of EPRV instruments. So the ones that all of you um, touched on, things like Nuit and Express and Espresso. Um, did, was that, did that require like developing new relationships with vendors? Did it require different science, interdisciplinary scientists? Maybe um, a few folks can, can talk about that. Maybe Chad, you can go first. Sure. If you yeah. so <laughs> one, one, one that comes immediately to mind for me um, for, for HPF, where we have a laser frequency comb, uh, commented that the Menlo laser comb uh, that they're using for Express and, and we're using a very similar version of that comb for Nuid is, is a commercial product and it works uh, pretty well. Um, but in the infrared, when we started HPF 10 years ago, there, there was no commercial laser comb. And so we started a collaboration with some folks at NIST uh, who are laser physics experts uh, to build a, um, a one-off, essentially a, a from the ground up uh, completely uh, uh, custom uh, design for that spectrograph laser comb. And it took a long time. Uh, we, we originally uh, got this funded by the NSF with, I, I don't remember how long the original proposal was. It was probably a four or five year build or something, but I think it took us seven years to actually um, build that. And that, that comb is extremely reliable now and it works really, really well. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think your, your point that we need to look outside of our discipline um, is, is really, really important, uh, not just for uh, technology like laser combs where physicists clearly know what's going on and astronomers are just, uh, uh, you know, looking for a, for a tool that we can plug in, um, but also um, in atmospheric science and solar physics, um, there's a lot of expertise that, that we need to bring into this field. Um, can I jump in, Johanna? Sure, go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did some, uh, for my second talk, which is recorded and on, online, I interviewed a few um, spectrograph builders, and the relationship with vendors was something that sort of came out over and over again. Uh, Francesco Pepe, uh, Andy Sanyorgi, Subrav Mahadevan, um, uh, Gabor Fiorez. Um, and uh, it, you know, it's, I, I've watched this process over the last 25 years and depending on your personality, when the vendor isn't delivering, uh, the temptation might be to like yell at them or to threaten a lawsuit or something. I mean, I have seen that and I can tell you that does not work <laughs> because we have no leverage, right? They, they can just walk away from the project. So what they lost $50,000, you know, on a, on a, on a little project, um, on a one-off project for an astronomer, but we lose our whole instrument. So instead, the more successful astronomers um, I see really nurture and build uh, those relationships and take the time to visit the vendors and establish this face-to-face -face personal relationship, which I think um, smooths over. Um, you do have to account for the fact that there will be some time delays which are outside of your control and it may come like we had a spheres that were being cut from these big parabolic mirrors and the vendor moved his lab and we had a, a that was just like killing our project. Um, but and then and then trouble with the laser frequency comb when we had that beep frequency come in. I was just so convinced that it was the Minlo guys <laughs> and they were so convinced that, that it was us. Um, and it ended up being 50-50. <laughs> so, you know, fortunately, I mean, uh, we had a great relationship with them and a really brilliant person on our team, Andy Shemkoviak, who really, you know, patiently worked through this. So there's something about, uh, I would say, instrumentation where you just, you have to be eternally optimistic, eternally patient, you know, and eternally persistent. <laughs> but yeah, that relationship is really important, Johanna. I'm, I'm glad you asked about that. It's also worth pointing out, I, I, I think Deborah and Andres and Mike would agree with this, that these vendors who we use, particularly for EPRV, but generally I think this is true across most astronomy instrumentation, are not making large profits off of us. Um, they're doing it because they're interested in it and they see some um, PR benefit or just general scientific curiosity to push, to push forward. Um, we are not a lucrative source of uh, revenue for them. 
Um, I just want to say something about uh, your chat's comment about us astronomers going outside the box. Um, I think the iodine cell is another example of that. I think the iodine vapor, this molecular absorption line spectrum was, as far as I know, already used as a reference in, in, in chemistry and I think in particular in solar observations. So it wasn't the exoplanet folks who came up with this in the beginning. So somebody heard how this was used and then adopted it for our purposes. Andreas, did you want to weigh in on that one at all or? Nothing to add at the moment. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, I'll go back to another question from an attendee, Vidad, um, who asks, perhaps this question might be better suited for another session, so feel free to punt. Um, but why are CCFs sometimes oversampled in radio velocity? For example, HARPS has a resolution of roughly two kilometers per second, but I've seen resolutions of 0.8 kilometers per second or even lower being used on the CCF. How are these different numbers related to pixel size, resolution element, or other things? So I can take a stab at that. Um, so when we calculate a CCF, and I, I, I think uh, Sharon Wang is gonna talk about this tomorrow, um, but when we calculate a CCF, we are, uh, the, the most common approach is to create a delta function as your reference kernel at the line position. And you do this for all of your different lines. Um, you can, uh, it, it's convenient if you can oversample that CCF because then you can more precisely measure the peak of the CCF and you can get away with this where you might not be able to get away with it with just a single line, but because we have hundreds or thousands of lines that we're sampling, that are measured in our spectrograph and they all land on slightly different pixel uh, positions across the uh, array, we end up effectively super sampling. Um, and so this works out. Okay, thanks. Um, another attendee question from Preeti. How do you account for fiber losses? <laughs> I mean, fiber losses are just something that you're going to have to bear if, if the result that you get, um, which is a more uniform illumination of the spectrograph, is worth it. So it, it just becomes part of the throughput budget, which is, it's sad that we don't have more perfect fibers. <laughs> And we're also very careful. I, I, I know we're very careful, and I, and I know Deborah is very, team is very, very careful with the fiber bundles as well. I mean, we, we, a lot of astronomy instruments that use fibers, um, you know, buck couple them, and, and particularly for multi-fiber fed spectrographs, cosmology, and things like that. Um, but in this, in this game, I know with HPF and Newit, our fiber uh, bundle, fiber feed from the telescope all the way down to the spectrograph is continuous. We splice. Um, with fusion splicer in places. We very, very carefully then go measure and characterize those splices. And if they don't uh, meet the specification because of a lot of different reasons, then we cut it apart and we redo it until we get it right. So it's a lot of iteration. There were many, many um, uh, graduate student and postdoc uh, years put into building the fiber bundles for those instruments uh, to try and optimize the throughput because you're right, you can lose a lot of photons very fast if you're not careful. Yeah, on the other hand, it's, it's not so bad. The internal losses of fibers in the wavelength range that we usually use is really small. So the main losses are getting the light into the fiber and then if you, the alternative would be to use a slit coupled spectrograph, so put it directly on the telescope, and then you also have slit losses because you don't get all the light through the slit. So one has to be careful as Jet points out, but in the end, it's not so bad. And the um, efficiency of a fiber coupled spectrograph is not that much lower than if you had direct coupling. And the benefits of the fibers, the scrambling they do for you are so large, um, that um, it's really worth it. There are other parts in the instrument, you may not be aware of that, that actually lose a lot more light than the fibers. The worst one is the grating. And uh, getting a grating with higher efficiency would be so nice, but that's where we really lose the photons. And of course, in the telescope also. I mean, 
um, telescope mirrors, um, also. So there, there are many places in which in principle one can try to be more efficient and um, everybody building an instrument tries to be as efficient as possible. In the end, we are happy if we end up in the 10% range. Putting all the errors together, uh, all the losses together. Oops, sorry, K kind of related to this, I'm curious how people size the fiber in terms of arc seconds on the sky, because it's something that I feel like I've never gotten right. With the Chiron spectrograph, um, we sized the fiber to the typical seeing, which was supposed to be 2.7 arc seconds, which was a disaster because then for like Alpha Centauri A and B that were coming closer together, the point spread function meant that the stars were leaking into the fiber when we would observe B, we got some of A. And so then for um, Express, I tried to be more surgical. We again, didn't have great data on the seeing distribution. Um, for the telescope, but we sized it to the median seeing of 0.9 arc seconds. And there are so many uh, nights that I wish that, you know, I had just like pushed it up a little bit to one arc second or 1.1 arc seconds. So it's this like tension between not wanting to include more stuff outside the star and um, still wanting to get as much of the photons as, as possible. So is there like, how do you guys decide? Maybe Andreas and Michael and Chad. <laughs> Yeah, I would guess in most practical cases, unless you have a special project like a double star that you're really after, um, making it as large as you can afford is a good idea because um, you want to collect all the photons you can get. We are using, we are observing very bright stars, so the sky background is not a ma major concern, but the biggest concern is um, as I showed in my presentation, that there is this um, direct relation between the size of the instrument, the spectral resolution, and the fiber size for a given telescope size. So um, you, you, you are really trading off the, I think the main trade off is normally between the size of the fiber on the sky and the resolution of the spectrograph. You can make the fiber smaller and get higher resolution, which is desirable in principle, but then as you make, if you make the fiber too small, then you are um, throwing away your precious photons, which is not good either. One should realize that um, if you say you make a fiber um, of in say one and a half arc seconds and you're seeing is one and a half arc seconds, you are collecting only half the light. Half of the light is then inside your fiber, half is already out. So if you really want to collect most of the light, you have to make the fiber substantially larger. And also, of course, you have that condition also only half of the time if it's the median at your telescope. So I think the practical, in practical terms, most people try to make it as large as they think is compatible with the resolution that you want to get and the budget that you have to make your spectrograph bigger. Well, okay. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. there's also the new idea to feed actually the fiber with an adaptive optic system. Yeah, and that's going to be very important on large telescopes because this, you know, the trade-off that Andreas just described with, with fiber size and resolution and seeing was one that we worried a lot about for HET um, with HPF because the, the natural seeing uh, in West Texas is not good, um, but it's also a 10 meter mirror. And so if you want to capture vote light and maintain high resolution, uh, you know, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. There is no, there's no magic uh, that allows you to, to get around that. So you've got to compromise. Uh, and as we push to larger and larger telescopes, we start deploying these EPRV spectrographs, fiber fed on 10 meter class and, and the, the, the TMT, ELT, GMT class telescopes. I see a question in the chat about that. This is a very serious trade off that has to happen. You can go to very high resolution, but you have to make your fiber smaller, at which point you're capturing less of the light uh, unless you're at a very good site. And then you've kind of negated a bunch of your 30 meter primary mirror, which is much more expensive than your spectrograph. Yeah, so actually, um, 
I mentioned that briefly in the formula that I gave for the resolution, um, you see that factor n times m, where, where n is the number of illuminated uh, grooves on your grating and m is the deflection order. And then you see some other terms, which is the size of the telescope and um, the, the size of the fiber on sky and so on. And many of you may remember from their um, introductory physics lectures, either at high school or as freshmen in freshman physics classes, you saw only n times m and learned that that was the resolution of the spectrograph. And that information is incomplete in that in implicitly assumes that you are using your spectrograph at the diffraction limit of the input. And normally we can't do that because we have the seeing. So um, in my very first uh, Michelson lecture, I explained what a seeing is, and you can probably still get that on the internet. Um, there is a parameter called the Fried parameter um, that describes, many of you may know that, um, describes how um, good the seeing is at your site. And um, the factor, or the, you can express the spectrograph resolution actually also as this factor n times m times the diameter of the telescope divided, uh, sorry, times the Fried parameter divided by the size of the telescope. So the Fried parameter um, gives the, um, yeah, the equivalent size of a telescope that would just be diffraction limited in those atmospheric conditions. So you can gain back that factor if you use adaptive optics, but it's really hard to do that in the visible. Um, there are now a number of um, instruments that try to um, go this route mainly um, with infrared spectrographs or with spectrographs designed for the really red part of the visible wavelength range. Um, that is good um, for M dwarfs, but um, if you want to observe um, stars like the sun, most of the radial velocity information, so the Q factor is highest in uh, the blue part of the visible spectrum. So there's a tension there also for radial velocity information, you would like to push into the blue, but building adaptive optics systems for the blue part of the visible in um, uh, uh, for a large telescope, that's really, really hard. So um, again, this is promising for the future and probably something to pursue, but um, it's not the golden um, route at the moment. Okay, um, another question. Um, what do you think about combining instrument RV measurements or using historical studies where instruments may have changed? Can you really do this or are there too many systematics involved? Well, I can, I can try a little bit. <laughs> um, we did this, we do this on a routine basis to basically take uh, published radio velocity data sets. And of course, in most of the time we are dealing uh, I would say 99% of the time we are dealing with relative radio velocities. So they're at an arbitrary zero point anyway. So you have to include this in your modeling that your, your gamma velocity offsets your zero points for each instrument have to be fit in the model process. Um, having said that, there is a, of course another um, subtle thing. You really have to know whether one data string coming from one instrument has indeed really the same zero point all the time during the observations, which is actually an, an, an advantage of the iodine cell that I have, not, um, I have not mentioned or forgot to mention is that if you don't, you know, if nothing happens to this iodine cell and the spectrograph doesn't change, it gives you basically the guarantee that there, is, uh, there, is, there are no zero point drifts because that reference spectrum is just super stable. But if you change something in your instrument, even using the same iodine cell, you can introduce small velocity offsets. So it's not unheard of that you have these long duration, multi-decade Doppler surveys. 
and you know the detectors were upgraded or one optical component in the spectrograph was, was changed that you can have small offsets even in, in, in the same RV data set. So it's, it's very important for us to, to really know the data as, as always, of course. <laughs> yeah. So in that context, it makes a big difference um, whether you are looking for planets with relatively short periods or planet with relatively long periods. If you are looking for a planet with short periods and you want to combine a few data streams, each one of them relatively long, then you have to adjust this offset. But um, the um, signal of the short period planet should be there in each one of those series. And then you can use the co-addition to increase your signal to noise for the discovery of the um, short period planet. You have to be very, very careful if you are really after long period planets. And a very good example for that is in my um, other pre-recorded talk where I show some historic astrome astrometric data where exactly that happened um, with astrometric observations. The instrument was changed a little bit and that introduced some long-term trends and people thought they had found planets which were later proven to be false. So uh, one has to be extremely careful with this type of combination. Um, if the um, period of the plant that you're looking for is not covered by the individual time series. Okay, so we have only a few minutes left and I wanted to get each panelists thought on kind of a forward looking question. Um, so some of you referenced kind of the historical context of, of EPRV and kind of where we've, we've been and where we're going. Um, so what, what advances in extreme precision radial velocity do you predict 30 years from now? Thirty years from now, you will be absolutely wrong with any prediction that you do right now. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> but I do think that we'll see advances in um, in handling stellar activity um, with with uh, with techniques, with statistical techniques, and and I think that's going to be key for pushing us down to. You know, it's really hard, right? It's just like when you write that instrument proposal and they, they want to know what your precision is going to be and how quickly you can deliver it. Um, you, we'll just, everybody will keep pushing and I bet we'll get down to 10 centimeters per second um, in, in the next 30 years. I, I think we're also in a position um, with this current generation, but I dubbed the third generation of instruments, um, new at Espresso Express, um, that we can actually start to separate out some of the technology problems that are really limiting us on that side. I agree, the stellar activity is, is a different issue, but um, you know, you, you go back, uh, not, not to, I don't want to, is the iodine technique, Mike. But one of the problems with it, as you said, is you know everything is tossed together in a giant bucket and kind of thrown under the rug. And that's magical because it means you don't have to worry about what's under the rug. Um, but at the same time, it's all blended together. And I think we're finally pushing from a technological sense, you know, it, we, we can separate out, are there problems with gratings? Are there problems with fiber scrambling? Uh, are there problems with the detectors and how they read out and transfer photons uh, that result in very, very small RV shifts. So we're, we're, we're getting to the point where we have traction on these. And so I think 30 years is a long ways to look, um, but maybe 10 years, I think we'll, we'll start to have uh, solved a bunch of these. Uh, I think many of them are eminently tractable. Any other comments on that question from panelists? Okay, well, if not, we can end there. Thanks so much.